Good evening. Good evening. Hey, y'all. I love seeing all your beautiful faces on an evening, Wednesday evening. Um, so good evening. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to our 2016 Transgender Day of Remembrance keynote with Raina Gossett. My name is Jen Sue Bishop. Um, I'm honored to be the director of the Milton E. Ford LGBT Resource Center here at Grand Valley State University. Um, and I wanted to start tonight by thanking a few people who made today possible. First and foremost, I want to thank our special guest, Raina Gossett, for traveling from New York City um, to join us here today. Um, and I also want to give a sincere thank you to Marla Wick, who many of you know, who serves as the Assistant Director of our LGBT Resource Center, who has been working tirelessly to organize this event from beginning to end. So a big thank you to Marla. And thirdly, I want to thank each of you for being here with us as we observe Transgender Day of Remembrance, to honor the memory of those lives who were lost due to acts of anti-transgender violence. Since 1998, communities around the world have organized events to observe Transgender Day of Remembrance. We hold this event today to honor the trans lives cut short due to violence and to honor the narratives and histories that so frequently remain untold. We're grateful to be in community with Reina, to learn with her, and to shine a spotlight on her leadership and activism tonight. Reina continues to show us the importance of honoring and retelling the history of trans activists who have come before us, amplifying the voices of oppressed people, organizing against economic injustice, and advocating for prison abolition. Along with Sasha Wurzel, Raina wrote, directed, and produced Happy Birthday, Marsha, a short film about legendary trans activist Marsha P. Johnson. As the 2014-2016 residents are activists in residence at Barnard College's Center for Research on Women, Raina produced and directed No One is Disposable, a four-part video series that discusses prison aboli abolition as a political frame and how to build societies where the process of creating justice is as important as the end, creating community where no one is exiled. She's currently working on a short animated film, The Personal Things, about iconic black trans activist, Miss Major. A longtime community organizer, Reina has worked as the membership director of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project from 2010 to 2014. She also worked at Queers for Economic Justice, where she directed the Welfare, Welfare Organizing Project and produced A Fabulous Attitude, documenting low-income LGBT New Yorkers surviving inequality and thriving despite enormous obstacles. Prior to her work at Queers for Economic Justice, Reina worked with Critical Resistance, organizing with low-income LGBT and gender nonconforming New Yorkers in a com campaign that successfully stopped New York City's Department of Corrections from building a $375 million new jail in the Bronx. Along with Eric Stanley and Johanna Burton, Reina is the editor of a forthcoming new museum anthology on trans art and cultural production to be published by MIT Press in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Reina Gossett. Thank you everyone for turning up on a Wednesday night to be with each other, to make meaning out of the issues that we're going through together, uh, to listen and watch and to share. I really appreciate it. Um, as I was being driven onto campus, I saw this amazing action uh, that was happening. How many people participated or supported or cheered it on in various ways? Cool. Does anyone who participated or organized around it want to share a little bit about it? I think it's like, really important to ground um, what I'm going to say and what's happening here locally. It's also totally fine to pass. Um, that's not a problem. No one expected to be standing up besides me in front of a group of people. So if you don't want to say, that's totally fine too. Thank you for the action today. Thank you for the ongoing mobilizing and organizing that you've been doing. It's so important to interrupt business as usual at places like universities to be um, supporting the study, uh, supporting the life of people who continue to be mostly directed, most directly affected by, um, by the election, by what was happening for centuries before the election. It's really meaningful to be in a group of people who consider this work at the um, so 
with a sense of urgency and importance, like how you've been demonstrating. So I just wanted to name that and say thank you for that. Um, so I'm Raina Gossett. I'm an activist, writer, and artist. And my background is in community organizing. And that means just looking at issues affecting people, navigating oppression, um, and building a movement that puts those people at the center, uh, puts people who are most directly affected by that violence. Because, and that's a principle that we call self-determination, right? Um, which just means that people who are most directly affected by an issue are powerful and capable of transforming the world um, and each other, right? And we should be at the forefront of all issues and all movements um, around transformation, right? Right now, I'm doing it through art and aesthetics. I'm looking at the sound and the feelings of liberation. I'm looking at the sound and feelings and aesthetics of gender self-determination, trans liberation, and the violence of the gender binary. Um, so this means looking at structures and systems, for me, this is what it means, that produce these kinds of violences, including issues of disability justice, anti-black racism, settler colonialism, borders, and the prison system, and the underlying logics that support those kinds of violences. Um, meaning working to abolish the prison industrial complex means that the notion that punishment makes people safer um, is actually one that we're organizing against, right? It's a pressing issue that, um, that we're all deeply affected by, that whether we know it or not. Um, so I just wanted to make a little introduction of who I am and where I'm coming from. And tonight I was imagining happening in kind of two different parts. I know a lot of us are really thinking about the election and kind of reeling from it or trying to and struggling to make sense of it or, um, you know, really impacted by the policies and behaviors that have happened since it. Um, so I wrote something about the election that's deeply informed by my practice as someone engaged in trans liberation. And I thought I'd read that. And then I thought I'd go into um, the piece around Trans Day of Remembrance um, that I really feel passionate about sharing and, and building a knowledge with everyone in this room. Um, and the two aren't separate, right? Like we, um, we know that, right? Um, the FBI just released a report, I don't know if people have seen that, but in the days since Trump's election, um, hate crime violence has escalated dramatically. How many people have seen that um, or felt it, right? Um, or had to survive it, right? Um, so that's um, meaningful and important to name, not just because um, that's a reality that we're having to move through, but also because so many of us have been moving through it for so long, right? Um, we were talking earlier about how trans women of color are facing for the past several years the highest documented rates of violence ever, right, ever recorded. Um, and that violence has escalated since uh, the election. So I thought I would just share some vantage points about how I'm thinking through the election and then um, move on into a f sharing a piece called The Personal Things um, that is you're one of the first audiences to see it. Um, it's about Miss Major Griffin Gracie. Um, so first I'm just gonna read. Um, so I wanna start off by saying, growing up in Boston during the 80s and 90s, I was one of the millions of children in the US who received welfare and disability benefits and had a parent in prison. Communication with my parent, who was my dad, uh, involved endless collect calls and letters. Seeing my dad involved my mom driving us to prison uh, and it meant bouts of shame as I lined up inside the prison with other people of color and poor people to see loved ones. It meant a scrutiny of our bodies through metal detectors. It meant removing clothing, checking our documents. It meant finally seeing my dad but remaining separated by thick glass or under constant monitoring by demeaning prison guards. At the time, I didn't understand how policies like President Clinton's 1994 crime bill, which allocated $10 billion to building prisons and criminalizing poor uh, communities of color, and also put tens of thousands of more cops on the streets and solidified our borders and implemented harsher sentencing laws. Um, if, if there's someone on the other side, they should come in. No, okay. Um, 
I didn't know these facts, right? I think a lot of us who were growing up as kids in the 80s and 90s were deeply touched by um, these facts, but didn't necessarily know them. I didn't know about Hillary Clinton um, supporting the 1994 crime bill and describing black people who were young people as super predators. Like, that wasn't familiar to me. I didn't know about these policies, but I felt their impact. I was ashamed of my fa family situation and felt compelled to lie about it to everyone around me, right? People who I think um, have, who are children of incarcerated parents are really familiar with lying about where a parent is or people who might not be children of incarcerated parents but need to survive in America um, are used to lying for our survival, right? Are used to lying and, talking, and not talking about things that feel really shameful. Um, and I struggled to make sense of what was going on. I struggled um, to overcome feelings of rage and powerlessness and shame that I felt daily. I was isolated from people who had an analysis to describe the reasons why incarceration was rapidly rising at the same time as access to public benefits was declining, right? why there were millions of people in prison, and how the structures of my life were the legacies of chattel slavery. Like, I didn't have that information. Bill Clinton was elected following the Reagan and Bush eras, and his election was celebrated by liberals, right? The same kind of people who uh, celebrated Hillary's um, candidacy, and progressives and radicals alike who believed and hoped that his pres presidency would mean the end to the violence and the war on drugs and the war on welfare strategies of his predecessors. We were wrong, right? Those of us who galvanized around Bill Clinton. And the normalization of that violence through Bill Clinton's administration and overt punishment schemes became further entrenched, right? That's the kind of legacy um, that we're up against right now. After the George Bush years, the same series of events played out when Obama was elected in 2008. So many of us, again, bought into electoral politics, the Democratic Party, the state, after years of building and mobilizing towards opting out of those very systems, right? We had choices to make and bought right back into the same systems of power. Joe Biden, Obama's running mate, was the Senate chair during the 94 crime bill um, and championed it. Uh, it wasn't a break from the system. It wasn't the system failing. Um, the system was working perfectly. That was the problem. That's what the problem is in, in a lot of our vantage points. Under the Obama administration, as anti-black violence escalated around the country, um, many of us witnessed the police murders of black people. The refrain from, the, um, from many of us uh, we saw was, how do we fix this system? But you know, there's a mantra that we have in the abolitionist movement, which is, the system isn't broken. It was built this way. Right? So that's what we were coming and navigating for the past decades. Um, and then last week, Donald Trump, Trump was elected president. Undoubtedly, I'm scared of what will happen under a Trump presidency. I'm scared of the types of policies that Trump has promised to put into effect. I am scared of so-called law and order, right, which just means to me uh, punishment, caging, and exile. I am scared of increased surveillance, deportation, escalations of violence, all of which have been already documented, like we were talking about before, right? The escalation of violence since Trump was elected. I am scared for what it might mean for my experience and those of I love. I am scared about what it means for our survival. What scares me in particular, though, as well, is that there are a lot of people who are using words like mobilize and organize who seem to think that things were OK until now, right? Like um, that because Trump was elected president, we're suddenly having to deal with white supremacy in the White House, rather than understanding that white supremacy is a precondition for the White House ever existing in the first place, right, on a very material way. Um, I lost my place because I got passionate. I'm going <laughs> to try to find it again. Um, uh, deportations are not new. Under the Obama administration, 2.5 million people were deported. Violence against trans people is not new. More trans women have been murdered this year than any other year, and each year is surpassing the last. White supremacy is not new. It is our national character, our, the organizing principle of the US. 
this election, in my view, isn't about backlash, right? If we understand um, that white supremacy is a precondition for the election, a precondition for democracy, a precondition for America, white supremacy is a precondition that makes some lives livable and relegates others to places like prisons, detention centers, homeless shelters, or makes them not happen at all. We, who have always had to refuse or flee power's grasp in order to survive, know what's at stake. We have known for a very long time. But I'm scared about these words, organize and mobilize, um, when used by people who want to turn movements for representation, visibility, and reform, um, like turn, turn, towards, turn our movements towards representation, visibility, and reform, these are projects that I think we've been deeply failed by um, that consolidate state and, in, and industry power. I'm scared that we will continue to turn towards the most legally acceptable and reasonable versions of ourselves, meaning that if we want to consolidate and ask for really narrow demands from institution like a university or institution like um, the state, that only the most acceptable versions of ourselves, the most assimilatable versions of ourselves, are going to be offering up those demands or going to be <laughs> negotiating around them. Um, one of the things, let me pause here and kind of bring into the histories that I'm coming from, that I'm a part of. In New York City in 1969, um, there were anti cross dressing laws, right? How many people are familiar with anti cross dressing laws? Okay. So anti-cross-dressing laws continue to be alive throughout the U.S. today, right? They're alive in prisons and jails and detention centers as we convene right here in this room. But uh, in New York City, there was a moral code um, that the NYPD enforced, which said that people could not be masked or made to alter their appearance, made to alter their appearance in ways that didn't conform with the gender they were assigned at birth, right? So if you were assigned male at birth, you had to wear three articles of male clothing, or you could be arrested, right? You would be put in jail. It was a, it was a moral code that the NYPD enforced, and it was specifically enforced on people who were gathering in public, right? So that um, was the conditions that were people were living through during the Stonewall Riots. How many people are familiar with the Stonewall Riots? Great. How many people are not? I love being in a room when people don't know. The movement that came up behind the first Stonewall Rebellion um, was labeled the Gay Liberation Front in New York City, or uh, the Gay Movement. And at first, they were doing really wonderful actions like um, you know, protesting the mass incarceration, right? Protesting police violence against black communities, protesting poverty. Um, but slowly but surely, those demands that looked at root causes of conditions that people had to face, right? Root causes of oppression, slowly but surely, they turned into looking at the symptoms of those root causes, right? So instead of starting talking about abolishing prisons, it moved slowly but surely to talking about job protection bills for white middle class professionals, right? And so the demands went from abolish prisons to don't fire me, right? Um, and there was a bill at the time called Intro 475 in New York City that um, the Gay Activist Alliance, which, you know, it went from Gay Liberation Front, it went from Rebellion to Gay Liberation Front to Gay Activist Alliance, right? Each time in each iteration of these kinds of revolutionary formations, the, um, uh, the levels of anti-black racism and transphobia escalated, right? And it reflected in their demands. Um, so the Gay Activist Alliance wanted New York City to um, have a bill called Intro 475 that would prohibit um, gay middle class people like doctors and lawyers and teachers from being fired, right? Um, and that's a good thing, right? People shouldn't be fired for, for our sexual identities. Um, people shouldn't be fired, you know, for our gender identities. Um, but what ended up happening was as the movement got smaller, the demands got smaller. So they were looking to be reflected in New York City and in the law rather than learning um, from the kind of revolutionary formations like the Black Panther Party that the law is nothing but against us, right? Like that, those are two very different understandings. Um, 
So by the time 1973 happened, there was this rally at Christopher Street um, and in Washington Square Park. And what had started off as an activist movement, um, as a rebellion against the police and uh, connecting it to things like prisons and jails, turned really quickly into a white middle class movement. And this person, Sylvia Rivera, jumped on stage. She was like, uh-uh, this is not going to happen in my city. Jumped on stage and interrupted it. Um, how many people are familiar with Sylvia Rivera? Cool, OK. So Sylvia Rivera was someone who, like we talked about, was one of the first people to fight back at Stonewall. And between Stonewall and the following years, she was really activated, right? She was working with her community, who were most vulnerable to multiple forms of oppression, to organize around the issues affecting their lives, right? It was self-determination, was what we were talking about. So one of the first big actions she did after Stonewall was she took over New York University um, you know, like students have always been at the forefront of social movements, like students in this room, right, um, and students in the past. She took over New York University with a group of students to protest New York City's, uh, New York University's homophobic policies that refused to allow um, two gay dance parties, right? And I bring that up because sometimes our, like, radical imagination of what um, actions are acceptable, um, because of the violences that we face, it gets smaller and smaller, right? Like, um, but I think those kinds of direct actions were really meaningful. And there's a slogan that people say, like, direct action gets the goods, you know? So, like, just bringing and thinking that in into the room as an important way of being. Um, so she took over New York University, and then she formed this group called STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Um, and they organized other people who are selling sex for money, other people who are people of color, other people who are trans. Um, and they did it really successfully, right? These were people who were left out of broader movements for social change, um, precisely because of the levels of anti-black racism and transphobia and classism that were in them, right? Um, so the first clip that I'm going to share is Sylvia Rivera at the 1960, uh, 1973 Pride Rally talking directly to um, the audience about how <coughs> left behind um, trans and gender nonconforming people have been, how left behind people in prison have been. Um, it's a clip that I found in an archive that I then uploaded to the internet. It didn't exist there before. I thought it was really meaningful and important because it spoke not just to issues that were happening in 1973, but also to things that are still happening in 2016 in terms of not connecting our struggles to uh, people who are most vulnerable to the violences that we face. I want to offer a content warning. Um, Sylvia Rivera talks about things like sexual violence, talks about things like um, physical violence, and um, it gets really intense. So I just want to say that before um, we watch it, in case people don't want to watch it, which is totally fine.
They do not like women. They do not like men. They like stars because we're trying to do something for them. I have been to jail. I have been raped and beaten many times by men, heterosexual men that do not belong in the homosexual shelter. But did you do anything for them? No, you all tell me to go and hide my tail between my legs. I will not no longer put up with this shit. I have been beaten. I have had my nose broken. I have been thrown in jail. I have lost my job. I have lost my apartment for gay liberation. And you all treat me this way? What the fuck's wrong with you all? Think about that. I do not believe in a revolution. But you all do. I believe in the gay power. I believe in us getting our rights, or else I would not be out there fighting for our rights. That's all I wanted to say to your people. That you all want to know about the people that are in jail. And do not forget Bambi Lamar and Dora Mark, Kenny Messner, and other gay people that are in jail. Come and see the people at Starhouse on 12th Street, on 640 East 12th Street, between B and C, apartment 14. The people that are trying to do something for all of us and not men and women that belong to a white middle class, white club, and that's what you all belong to. Revolution now! In This moment in the 70s is so instructive because the stakes are so real for many of us, right? The stakes of what our demands are have incredible effects on so many of our communities, right? Communities that are already at a heightened vulnerability for violence. And I really want to encourage us to dream big um, when we're thinking about what our demands are. When I was growing up, I was one of a, hi, welcome back. Um, when I was growing up, I was one of a um, few poor black students at a wealthy white school. My teachers uh, in textbooks taught me that the U.S. was a colony of England that gained independence in 1776. Maybe many of us were taught that. Based on values of freedom and sovereignty. My teachers in textbooks taught me that structural racism ended thanks to the 1960s civil rights movement. And that we're all equal now. They taught me that racism was interpersonal, right? So racism was something that uh, poor white people in the South did to, to black people, right? And don't do that because it's beneath you, right? Um, usually uh, it meant saying something bad. They taught me that because we're all equal, any hardship that I might encounter or my family or my friends might encounter was because of something that we did, right? Um, it was our responsibility. If we were having a hard time, it was our fault. They taught me that our borders and bombs keep us safe and that in the US and that the US was the best country around. The counter narratives that I found were really small and fleeting, right? They were pieces of information that showed me something else. Like at 13, I was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and listening to his speeches on cassette tapes, reading George Jackson's Blood in My Eye, the spook who sat by the door. Um, these were like the fleeting kinds of information that I had to provide a counter narrative. The power structures that I had to navigate taught me that if I wanted to have an impact on the world, I needed to one, make money, a lot of it, like be an investment banker, or two, have an official position of power. I was told that the people with a lot of power have the best ideas about how to change the world, right, which is a really, um, like, inverted principle to the principle of self-determination, right? The people who are experiencing something are the, um, the best ones to strategize around it. 
So, you know, I was getting a lot of these messages and I decided that's what I was going to do. Um, you know, it's kind of surprisingly, like I'm doing something very different now, but at the time I was like, I'm gonna run for governor and then I'm gonna become president of the United States. Um, I was on the floor of the Democratic National Convention. I was hired to be a speechwriter for a NYC borough president, um, which are kind of like the people under the mayor. Um, and it was a job that I decided not to take um, because I started becoming politicized in a different way, right? Um, which helped me understand the power of social movements. I was starting to spend more and more time with people who had a critical analysis about stru things like structural racism, um, institutional racism, and settler colonialism. I offer this kind of history up because I think many of us um, who at different times feel powerless are surrounded by messages about who can have an impact on the world, right? And sometimes we feel really bad because we believe them, right? Like, I believed that in order to have a real impact on the world, I had to be at the top of a certain kind of hierarchy. Now I believe something really different. Um, and that happened because of how I was politicized, which meant it happened because I spent more and more time um, with a group of people who were thinking critically through the issues like um, settler colonialism and structural racism. Um, so my political education came from people asking questions. Um, I wanted to name an organization called Southerners on New Ground. How many people are familiar with song? Cool, okay, yeah. So does anyone want to say what song is? No problem. So song is an organization that works throughout the southern region of the US um, and it works to break isolation, to do community organizing work, to mobilize um, people who are queer, trans, gender nonconforming, um, and specifically people of color and poor people. Um, and they do it on a model, part of the work involves the Mississippi Freedom School tradition model, right? Which was um, that of political education. How many people have heard of the Freedom Schools? When the Freedom Schools gathered, they would ask three questions each time. Um, how many, are people familiar with this? They would say, what uh, does the dominant culture have that we want? What does the dominant culture have that we don't want? And what do we have already that we want to keep? And those became, those kinds of questions became um, the principles through which people strategized during the black freedom movement, also known as the civil rights movement. And I offer those up because I think that now is a really important time in the wake of the election of Trump to think about not just our demands, right? Um, not just how we organize, but also what do we have already that we want to keep and grow more of? Um, and so that's the part that I'm going to talk about, which is art. For me, that is um, the really transformative power of art and art making um, at a moment when people are facing heightened forms of violence. So um, last year, uh, me and many hundreds of other trans and gender nonconforming people gathered in Chicago for the Insight Women of Color Violent, uh, Women of Color Against Violence convening. Or any, was anyone there? No. Okay. Um, and also the Transgender Law Center convening. We were gathering at a time of when we were really feeling the kind of life or death stakes um, that our communities faced, and we were there because we wanted to think about what does the dominant culture have that we want. What does the dominant culture have that we don't want? And what do we have that we want to keep? Um, and we spent days and days and days strategizing about how we've been organizing throughout the US in different regions in, in really beautiful and abundant ways. And what are some of the challenges that we have throughout the, uh, the US in different regions? And what are ways that we've been able to maneuver around them? One of the people who was there was the legendary activist, Miss Major, um, who, like we talked about before, was one of the first people to fight back at the Stonewall riots. Um, so Miss Major is a person that I met in 2007 when we helped to organize Transforming Justice, which was a, a conference in um, Oakland, uh, California, that was for people who were trans and gender conforming who were navigating criminalization. So people who had just gotten out of prison, people who had spent lifetimes in prison, who weren't able to be there in physical form, but participated through letter writing, and those of us who navigated criminalization in a bunch of different ways. So Ms. Major and I spent a lot of time talking about, in a moment of heightened violence, what are some really profound ways that we can fight back that we can refuse power's grasp, right? That was a really big question that we spent talking with each other. 
Miss Major is someone who has worked both within organizations. Uh, she was recently the executive director of the Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project and outside of formal organizations. But as she says, we don't have to be in formal organizations. We don't have to be in formal uh, le leadership positions. Um, what I heard today about the action, which was really cool and very inspiring, was the official organizers weren't identified, right? Like there was no one particular leader of that action. That's in line with Ms. Major's legacy, right? That's actually something that is deeply unruly to how an institution tells you how to organize, right? An institution tells you how to organize and says, well, you need like a president of the club and you need a board and you know, they're structuring it based on the institution. So I was really amazed that that's how the, orga uh, that's how the action happened today. So as Ms. Major says, you don't have to be in a formal organization uh, recognized as a formal leader to do the profound work of never being with the state or the mainstream white gay movement, which is what Ms. Major um, and Sylvia and Marsha have always been fugitives to, um, or be seen as normal, right? Ms. Major emphasizes the historical importance of small individual acts of liberation that refuse and seek to undermine the gender binary and assimilation, right? These personal acts of resistance and refusal have created space for us to come together in this room right now and support one another. At a time of heightened violence, just by hanging out, by taking up space, by interrupting business as usual, like you did today, we're, by taking care of each other, we're doing profound revolutionary work. And Ms. Major's you know, remarks made me think about, well, what are the small personal ways that I refuse, that I'm unruly, right, to assimilation? And to me, the more I thought about it, the more I thought art is a place of that, art and fashion, right? I learned this um, framework from Southerners on New Ground that Places of violence are precisely those because of the profound possibilities for transformation, right? So land being extracted and uh, colonized is happening precisely because of how powerful and capable trans um, the possibilities of land, trans uh, sorry, let me start over again. Land, spirit, bodies, and labor are places of extraction and oppression and violence, right? Places of capture but they're precisely those because they offer up profound possibilities for transformation. Is that clear what I'm saying? So thinking back about the anti-cross-dressing laws of 1969, right? I was thinking about there must be something really powerful about expression and fashion that's unruly to the state's morals, right? There must be something there. Um, there must be something that undermines the state's morality that you know, can offer up forms of transformation that I want to be a part of, right? So the more I thought about that, the more I thought about aesthetics being a really, um, like a really wonderful strategy for me for right now, for interrupting business as usual, right? For interrupting and undermining the gender binary. Um, and part of that led me to making the film that I did called Happy Birthday, Marsha. And I'm gonna play the trailer for that. How many people have seen the trailer? few of us. Okay, great. Most not. Um, so Happy Birthday, Marsha is a short film about Marsha Peyton Oman Johnson, who, like Sylvia Rivera, fought back at the Stonewall riots. And then, like Sylvia, took over New York University, right? Had a direct action taking over a university. I'll just say that a couple more times. Um, <laughs> that led to a really wonderful, um, you know, like, demands being met. And also built Star House, a street transvestite action revolutionary house, um, and was sadly found in 1992 in the Hudson River during Gay Pride, right? So she was killed and found in the Hudson River, which is a river in New York City, um, at a time that all of New York, or much of New York, was celebrating her actions at the Stonewall Riots, right? The irony of that, right? That Pride uh, was an, uh, an action event moment that she started and then also a moment when her body was found killed. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to what we were talking about, about the violences of assimilation and what happens when many of us are left behind. But um, she wasn't just an activist, she was also an artist. Uh, she was a member of this group called the Hot Peaches where she was a performer. 
Um, and her life kind of serves as a place of really meaningful interruption uh, and, and inspiration for me when I sometimes get so bogged down on what um, like formal community organizing is. Um, Miss Marsha P. Johnson was a, like a fugitive to anything formal, right? Um, so to me, that's why her life and her work and the traces of her life and her work in New York City are so meaningful to many of us. So I'm gonna play that trailer now. In case you didn't get the message, but I see you did, what you all are the message, we have someone here that's going to sum it all up to you again. So um, happy birthday, Marsha, to me was something that was so life-affirming, right? We were doing it as a political and an artistic project. Uh, it was happening at a moment, uh, we shot at a moment when much of the art and the film about trans lives was um, cis people playing trans characters. Uh, not just that, but it was for an audience of like mostly white middle class suburban people, right? Like it was never intended to be seen or experienced by trans and gender nonconforming people. And we wanted to interrupt that, right, with our film. Um, so we wrote the story and we also cast ourselves. We cast non-traditional actors. Um, Maya Taylor is a traditional actor, is someone who was in this film Tangerine. I uh, was a star of Tangerine. And she just like, every day she was on it. Um, and we also felt like the aesthetics, the um, the way that beauty is in that film is so important. So our cinematographers, this person Arthur Jaffa, who um, shot the Solange music videos that just came out, and also uh, Daughters of the Dust and um, Crooklyn, and just really has a long um, practice, long artistic practice around um, black life and being beautiful, right, and showing that. And the score was the also Gia Wyeth who provided that. Um, and we wanted it to be like something that, you know, as a community organizer, the work that I did so often was around institutions, right? Changing policies with institutions, um, seeking to change the ways that people behaved within the institution. Um, changing the way people felt within an institution, sometimes dismantling an institution, right? Um, but this to me felt like it was getting at a different place of violence. Um, before we had a little round table and we talked about the five eyes of oppression. Are people familiar with that? So the five eyes of oppression are ideological, institutional, interpersonal, interior, or internalized, and isolation, right? And community organizing, like the work that Miss Major did, um, is really great at changing institutions, right? And often really good at interrupting the kind of oppressive ways that people interact with each other. But in my experience, didn't really, um, for me, didn't have a meaningful effect on changing people's interior condition. Um, and also, uh, pe how people felt, right, about themselves and about each other, and also never got into a place of transforming ideas. So for me, that has been my small personal way of being unruly and fighting back. Um, so I think 
that's a good moment to stop and talk um, to everyone in the room. When I come into spaces, I think there's a, a lot of times there's the expectation that the person speaking at the front of the room is the expert, um, which is why I, I part of my practice is to ask people, if you've seen this, have experienced it, what do you think about it? What's going on here? So I really want to continue to disrupt that. Um, so if we want to ask each other questions, if we want to share when someone asks me a question, all of that's okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to transition into Q and A now. You know, one of the principles that I believe in from community organizing is that social movements require all of us, right? Um, and that's how things change through social movements, right? Um, that doesn't mean that we all need to be taking up space in the same particular kinds of ways. In fact, uh, you know, much of it is about being mindful about the ways that we take up space and whose leadership we support and how. So I think, you know, um, concretely, I think oftentimes, like, uh, access in universities um, is distributed really unfairly, right? So some people have access um, to, like, really practical things like rooms or printing or um, some people have no access at all. Some people have access to, like, hearing about all the different events that are happening in a week. Some people are struggling with so much isolation that they don't know at all. So I think thinking really um, critically about how people with a privileged relationship to access can support people who are so often left out of that space or um, pushed out of that space is a really good place to start. I think also, um, you know, outside of an institutional setting, um, you know, there are millions and millions of people who are currently incarcerated throughout the U.S. That relationship, um, the university's relationship to incarceration is deep and inextricably linked, right? Like, um, from who makes the chairs to uh, what, who can afford to attend universities and schools to who can't, who's denied access to these spaces. So I think, like, for me, that's been one of the reasons why so much of my work has been around um, prison abolition. And I think that <coughs> allyship and support and solidarity in um, the prison abolitionist movement has meant so many different things. Sometimes it means, um, you know, being a pen pal. I think that's actually a really profound way that a lot of people's lives have been changed. Um, when uh, you're incarcerated, um, when you're in a detention center, uh, often when you're in a hospital, um, the levels of isolation that you face are truly profound. And having people to write to you is something, is a strategy that I've heard um, and I've experienced uh, doing letter writing that really like um, can have, you know, if isolation is one of those five eyes of oppression, we should all be doing work around isolation, right? Um, so that kind of work I think is really important. Um, work for people who are in prison who are queer and trans I think is like, of, and disabled is of utmost importance. So organizations like the Sylvia Rivera Law Project or Black and Pink um, or outside of the U.S. Bent Bars, those are all places where people are kind of thinking through questions of allyship and solidarity um, within social movements. It's a really important text and part of what I think is important to it too is that it says, you know, study is making meaning together, right? So we're, we're studying right now, right? We're making meaning together. So often the university, the classroom, can be a huge obstacle to study, right? Like, and I think that's why spaces like tonight and the actions that you're doing are so important because they're making more room for study. And it also says, you know, going back to this whole STAR NYU thing, that the only relationship to have with the university is a criminal one, right? Like, so just like if we want to start there um, and think about like how we want to study, uh, while having a criminal relationship, right, then I think um, we'll really benefit, right? Our, our study, our making meaning will really benefit and we'll get to questions like how do we support the expression of, of, um, of all trans and gender non-conforming people. It'll, um, anyway, so I just wanted to add that a little bit. 